My name is Rich Schmidt. We're here with Michael Lichtenwalter at Lichten, Lichtenwalter Vineyard in uh, Newburgh, Ribbon Ridge. Uh, it's April 3rd, 2023. Michael, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, the first question to get you started is why wine? Well, we actually came to uh, the Oregon wine scene relatively late. We moved into Lake Oswego in about 81 from uh, the Midwest. Raised our kids in Lake Oswego in about 2000 or so. We got our nest empty, and that's really the first time we ventured out into Oregon wine country. Uh, and until then, we'd been kind of your average wine consumer with uh, dinners and maybe something at the grocery store every now and then, but not really a very deep dive into wine in general or Oregon wine specifically. But in 2000, we had the uh, the uh, serendipitous event of going wine tasting. We actually went down to the Dundee Hills. We uh, stopped at uh, Erath, at Tory Moore, and at Lang on that uh, that day, and. Uh, a couple of things captured us on that day. One was the beautiful scenery, as you can see behind me. It's just, uh, it's very, very pleasing on the, on the eyes and uh, on the soul to be out in wine country. It's just gorgeous. Um, second thing that happened was back in, back in 2000, the wine industry was maybe 200, 250 wineries instead of the thousand it is today. And you could, uh, uh, most of the owners and the, and the winemakers were in the wineries and the wineries and the tasting rooms were sort of combined back in those days. Mm -hmm. um, so you could rub elbows with, uh, with the people in the, the stakeholders in the, in the business. And that kind of got me excited as well, their passion and their enthusiasm for what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And then the third thing that happened to me on that, that day we went tasting was, I had no idea Oregon was making world-class Pinot Noir. And uh, this is some of the best Pinot in the world is made in Oregon. And that kind of intrigued me. So those three together got me rolling and uh, got me thinking about my next chapter in life. Because uh, the kid chapter and my main career chapter was sort of uh, at its peak or winding down at that point. And we were starting to think of what's our retirement chapter going to look like? What's chapter three going to look like? Mm -hmm. And uh, saw this as, as a very viable option for us. So we. Uh, I went to Chemeketa for a couple of years, got the theory, uh, made some really bad wine in my garage in Lake Oswego while we were looking for this property, um, but you know, started to learn what the fermentation cycle was all about and uh, what not to do and how important good quality material is in your, in your winemaking process, because the material I was using was not really the greatest material, but it was grapes. Uh, and, but my main goal in that whole process was to get enough theory and enough education to be able to shop for a vineyard property with an educated eye. Uh, I didn't want to buy uh, oceanfront property on the swamp somewhere. I wanted to know uh, what I was looking for. We looked uh, for about, we probably looked for a year for property on and off. And we used a real estate agent that was a specialist in wine properties and uh, finally happened up onto this particular site, which was an a hazelnut orchard at the time we, uh, we, we found it. In fact, this whole valley from Utopia just to our south all the way up to what used to be Kathy Redmond's, which now Josh has, was one long uh, hazelnut orchard. And the ground, uh, if you've ever been in a hazelnut orchard, is not the healthiest ground to walk into and want to plant uh, cash crop into. So I was a little, a little, a little hesitant to, uh, to jump in on this property. The things that it had going for it were, one, that it was on Ribbon Ridge. Uh, to the buyers, uh, the seller was in a, a bank estate department, so I didn't have a really interested seller. So I had some leverage there to get better pricing. And then the third thing that happened is when I was on the site with the real estate agent, we looked up, uh, you can't see it on the camera probably, but in the middle of the hill across from us, there's a vineyard. And I asked him what that vineyard was, and he said, well, that's Beaufort. And that kind of caught my interest. <laughs> if we were in Beaufort's neighborhood and in that same terroir or that same soil, uh, I thought it was worth drilling a little bit deeper into. So we ended up buying the property, took a couple of years to wind our way out of Lake Oswego and come out here. We came, actually came out here and we bought the property in 2003, uh, built the house in 2005, and moved out in uh, late 2005, 2006 onto the property and been here for the last, what is that, 18 years now? 17, yeah. 18, yeah time, yeah. time flies. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Sure does. All right, I got lots more questions about that, but let's back up a minute. You mentioned this being chapter three. Tell us a little bit about life before wine for you. Where were you born and raised, and what was your sort of career path? So I was born in the Midwest, a suburb of uh, Chicago. I was actually born in Chicago, but grew up 
in a, about 20 miles west of Chicago in a suburb called Glen Ellen. Uh, and at the time, uh, 100 years ago when I was growing up there, it was, uh, was very rural, uh, very farm country, uh, a lot of corn, a lot of soybeans, a lot of wheat around us. Um, it was a great place to grow up. It was kind of like the Lake Oswego of Chicago. It had a lot of similarities in that it was a relatively wealthy um, suburb, uh, comfortable suburb to grow up in. But by the time Kay and I had had our children, uh, Chicago had run over the town and the farm country was all gone. It was strip malls and condos by the time we were having our kids. And it was a whole different lifestyle than what I grew up in. And we wanted more of an outdoorsy lifestyle to uh, raise our kids in. And so we looked uh, primarily in the Northwest. We looked in the uh, Seattle area and then in the Portland area and luckily decided on the Portland area and uh, came here in 81, right after Mount St. Helens blew up. My family thought I was completely crazy to move out by a volcano. Um, but it was kind of watch, fun to watch the uh, puff alert to the, uh, what the volcano was doing for that first year or two on the news. It was uh, always exciting to see what the volcano was doing. But uh, we ended up uh, living in Lake Oswego from 81 to uh, 2005 when we moved out here. And the career that I did when I came out here is I'm a CPA. And so I was working in public accounting when we moved out. And through the 20 years or so we were in uh, Lake Oswego, I evolved through the finance uh, career path and went into private accounting and uh, eventually got my executive MBA at the Oregon program, uh, University of Oregon program, which kind of gave me a little bit broader set of skills than just the CPA set of skills, mm -hmm. which allowed me to kind of go into a consulting world. Mm -hmm. And I went into, um, went into investment banking for a number of years and sort of learned the merger acquisition route, learned more. And my, my role in the merger and acquisition firm was more of a CFO consultant. And that's ultimately where I am today. I still do some CFO consulting, but on a very limited basis. And um, my primary client is a classmate from my executive MBA days. He has a very successful company in, uh, in Tualatin and he's got financial needs that are in the healthy seven figures and needs a CPA level quality uh, skill set to help him with his bank and all that type of stuff. So I do that for about three companies right now and then uh, when I'm not doing that, I'm driving the tractor around. <laughs> like all CFOs do yeah. on the side. <laughs> uh, so tell me about uh, how that became the career path for you. What, what interested you in finance, uh, pu public accounting? Uh, well, back when I uh, was in school, I was looking for a professional career, something that had sort of a, um, a level of skill set required to make you a specialist. And I also wanted, uh, when I started looking at that whole area, um, I wanted to, to sharpen my, my problem solving skill set. Is I figured out pretty early that you don't make a ton of money just necessarily being an employee, but when you can get to the level of consulting and being able to solve other people's financial problems, you can start to not only add a lot of value to their business, but you can make a healthy living at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I sort of saw that early in the public accounting realm that that had a path to that um, vocation. and. Uh, it took, only took 25 years to get there, but it, it, it was a slow path. Just it's got a lot of similar things to the uh, wine world and the vineyard world in that it takes a lot of patience and it takes time to get to where you want to get to. It's not a not a switch. It's a dimmer thing, and it takes a while to to progressively build up where you want to get to. So you mentioned that before, kind of your revelation about wine, you were a fairly typical wine consumer. So tell me tell me what that means to you and and. You did you have any conception of Oregon wine? Really, no. I uh, I had drunk a few and had been to a few wineries for uh, you know weddings or social events and things like that, but hadn't really gotten um, bitten by the bug, so to speak, or the snake or whatever it is. Uh, but uh, I always enjoyed those events. Uh, there's something magical about being on a vineyard and being in a winery that. Uh, just is, just feels good. It's just uh, really nice. But I, I, it, it wasn't compelling enough until that event in 20 uh, or 2000 to make me want to make it a career, to really pursue it. Uh, I think it was, it was as much of a uh, time in my life as it was a 
you know, an opportunity. I was just, it was the right time in my life to look at that opportunity and it came along at the right time and everything lined up and uh, it's kind of fortuitous how things happen, the timing of things are as important as, as what they are. But uh, it's, you know, it's 180 degree different than the finance world where you're, you know, it's all in your head. Uh, where this is all around you and it's in the dirt and it's tangible, where the finance world is spreadsheets and completely intangible. Uh, so for the last 15 years or so where I was still very much in my finance career and uh, growing and planting the vineyard, it was a great release from the two. They were completely opposite of each other. So spending four to five days in the finance world and then three to four days in the vineyard was very refreshing and very rejuvenating for me. and. Uh, Help me keep my sanity. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned Chemeketa as the first stop along the way for yourself. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that experience for you. What did you learn, and what, what were the what were the surprises? Uh, I think the 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 key messages or key things I learned from that experience, besides the theory, uh, which is always a nice foundation to have, but. Uh, was, was the contacts you made and some of the relationships you made. Like I was lucky enough to have Al McDonald as my viticultural teacher and Al's a legend in the Oregon wine industry and he was just a great guy to get to know in those first couple of years and I bump into him every now and then. I don't know if he still remembers me because he's probably had so many people through his programs that I'm just one of the numbers but uh, he, it, was, it was kind of fun to have that connection and to make the connection of all the people that were in the program at that time. I still see a handful of those people from, that was 20 years ago, mm -hmm. and there's two or three of them that I still am friends with, just like from my uh, MBA program, I still have a, those connections are what those programs are all about, mm -hmm. and the relationships that you get there. And uh, if you're lucky, uh, they're healthy, they're good, and they're uh, constructive for everybody involved. Mm -hmm. So my, my, my recollection of the Chemeca thing was, was the theory was, was good. It, it certainly in, improved the winemaking results that I started with in my garage from what I'm doing today. Uh, but you know, that foundation uh, is still very important to me. Those protocols that I learned in winemaking 101 uh, are still things I use today and still draw back on. So it was kind of the, the, the seed that planted the whole tree came from Chemeketa. So at the time you completed the work at Chemeketa, what were you sort of thinking about? You mentioned you were going to look for property and you were helping. That was helpful for, for narrowing down what you wanted to look for. What was the plan at that point? Were you thinking you would make wine? Were you thinking you would be very involved in the process? What, was kind of, what were you kind of thinking at that point? Yeah, my initial plan was to find a 15 plus acre parcel so I could hit kind of those thresholds that you need to build a wining, build a tasting room. Uh, and I sort of had originally planned was to kind of do it quickly. Let's get to 15 acres, let's get to three, 4,000 cases, or whatever it is, and away we'll go. And I quickly, uh, as soon as I, we bought the property, we took two to three years to just kind of take the hazelnut orchard down, regenerate the ground, and then we started planting slowly. We planted, uh, we planted a half acre right by the house that's a field blend. It's actually nine rows of pinot with seven different clones in it. Uh, and we were primarily after uh, just to make sure that the ground was healthy enough to support the plants and that the toxicity in the ground wouldn't kill them right away. And, and they did fine. And that, uh, that field blend was not not intended to be the field blend that it's turned into today, but it's one of our most popular wines that we make. When you wrap those seven clones into a co-fermentation and bottle it, it makes a spectacular wine. Mm -hmm. And we only make about 100 or about 50 cases of it every year and it sells out like a hot cake. It's really, really a great, uh, great little thing. But so my, my vision was pretty grandiose and then reality set in and, and I figured out that well, the vines have to get to four to five to six years old to get to where they're, they're dependable and they start to give you some good results back. So I, I slowed everything down and I planted, instead of doing 15 acres on day one, I, I did three acres and then Two years later, I did three acres, and then two years later, I did three acres. I didn't want to make all my mistakes at one time. I wanted to spread them out over 10 or 15 years, and I was very successful at doing that. Uh, but no, I actually, you know, the thought was to learn as we go and make this mistakes on a small uh, parcel, and then hopefully get more efficient as you went on with it. And we started out pretty much as a family farm. Uh, Kay and I, and I, my oldest son, Brian, 
uh, and my other two kids as well. But my oldest son, Brian, has a horticultural degree, so he was a, a big help in the original establishment of the vineyard. But we, until we got to be three acres and you know 5,000 plants, we could pretty much keep up with it ourselves. Uh, in fact, it, it, it was doable, but as soon as we planted the next three acres and went to uh, you know, 6,000 plants, 7,500 plants, we just couldn't get through it fast enough. Uh, it, it was just too many plants for us to get to. <clears throat> and I was lucky enough to run into the vineyard manager I'm using today, who is uh, Javier Marin and his boys. Uh, and he was vineyard manager over at Shea for a number of years. Javier's got, you know, more experience than most people I know in, in how to farm a, a vineyard. So once we got to this, this acre 456, Javier came in and has been helping us ever since, keeping that going. I am pretty much limited to the tractor work now, uh, and they do all the canopy management and all the pruning and all the, all, because there are now, there are now, let's see, there's 13 acres of vines out there, so there's almost 17, 18,000 vines out there, <clears throat> which takes, you know, a lot of time to go through. It takes some manpower to get through all that, and it's got to be done on time, mm -hmm. and it's got to be done correctly, and he's a pretty meticulous farmer, <clears throat> and we've got what we consider to be some pretty premium ground, so we want to optimize what, what the product that we're getting off it is, mm -hmm. uh, so we want to farm it right, mm -hmm. and Javier has been really great at that. But so, so the, the original gangbuster plan slowed down. Once we got to about five years ago, it was about 2018, I was starting to slow down in my career a little bit, and so I decided it was time. I, I didn't have that many more vintages in front of me, so I said, well, if we're gonna do a brand and we're gonna do a label, we better start it. And, and I had up to that point, and I still do today sell the majority of my grapes to my neighbors. Uh, and I was lucky enough to run into Drew Voigt of Harper Voigt, who is the consulting winemaker up at Eminent Domain, who has been uh, a purchaser of my grapes for a number of years. Uh, and Drew was willing to take on my winemaking project. So but before that, I had been using that field blend block. It's a half an acre, mix about four barrels of wine, maybe three, depending on you know what Mother Nature is doing for you. And we would get about 50 cases or so. We would make that down in our little wine room every year just to literally keep our hands in the winemaking process. And that made some great house wine for a number of years. But when we got to 18 and I said, okay, let's make three to 400 cases of red wine, and let's make 100 cases or so of rosé. What I have space downstairs for one fermenter comfortably, but not six. And uh, so Kay, being the wise woman that she is, she said, I don't think I want you to build a million dollar winery. Why don't you find a different way to do that? And so we, we talked to Drew, and that's where we've been ever since with Drew. And Jessica West is actually, uh, you know, she, she does the heavy lifting over there and Drew gets the credit, but they're, they're a great team. We really enjoy working with them and uh, uh, they make some great wine for us. You mentioned uh, when you started the, when you sort of bought the property, you mentioned the, the soil and, and it needing help. So tell me about that process and about sort of, first of all, realizing it and second of all, actually getting it to the point where you could grow the grapes you wanted to grow out there. What was the process like for you, and what did you kind of what did you lean on uh, in terms of edu an educational background? Mm -hmm. Well, the the key thing was to get the the herbicides out of the ground, and and that time is the best healer of that time and cover crops. Uh, so when, once we took the hazelnut orchard down, um, we just put uh, uh, nitrogen fixing cover crops and bi biomass builders into the ground and dis those in for. Um, quite a few years. In fact, we've still got a little two-acre part that's under pasture, and uh, we just keep putting nutrients and, and, and organic matter back into that ground. Um, the key here is that it's that ancient sedimentary soil, so it's 40, 60 million year old sea bottom soils here. Um, it's the Willa Kinsey series, and just little deviations of the Willa Kinsey series, very deep very healthy once you get the toxicity, toxicity out of it. Uh, and, it. And really by 2005, six, it was in great shape again. It was, uh, it's very hardy. It's almost coming on too vigorous a site because you don't want too much canopy. You want to balance out there. And uh, the kind of sandy, um, 
uh, very light. It's kind of a blonde soil versus there's no volcanic ash in it. There's not a rock in the entire vineyard. Um, and I love to tell the story to people that come here and taste that have been to the other AVAs around that we've got the same subsoil as Dundee and as Shehala Mountain and as Yamho Carton, but they've each had a different geological event that's completely changed the way their wines come out. The volcanic ash in Dundee, the tectonic plate pump in the Shehala Mountains that brought all the rocks up, and then uh, there's some volcanic and some more organic matter as you go west of us into the Shehala, I'm sorry, the Yamho Carton AVA. But our little island on Ribbon Ridge is just this pristine old sedimentary soil, which grows a, just a really elegant, really fine wine. And uh, our job is to make it as healthy and as strong as we can coming out of the vineyard and then stay out of its way. So it wasn't, wasn't really anything, you know, it wasn't really a, a, a SWAT team that we had to bring in to recover the soil. It was, it was a matter of time. Tell me about the first grapes when they, when you got you got your grapes you got, you got your vines planted. Mm -hmm. Wait the time, all the all the effort, all the waiting. Tell me about the, what the first grapes. That's kind of a fun story. It's one I don't like to remember. But our fir <laughs> our our first um, commercial crop off the three acres down below us came in 2010, and one of my classmates uh, from Chemeketa, her name is Ann Habach, runs Helioterra and uh, Portland. Um, had agreed to buy the grapes. We were thinking we were gonna get close to eight, maybe nine tons off the three acres. And 2010 was the year of the birds. Uh, and I had no idea how to fight birds at that time. So I went out to OVS and I bought a bunch of the bird squawker boxes that scream like 10 birds getting killed, different stuff. Set them up down there and walked away and thought I was good. <laughs> Those starlings came through and they probably took 70% of my grapes to California in their tummies. And we, start, yeah, we ended up with maybe two, three tons coming off the crop that year and uh, it was just disaster. So uh, we, learned, we learned the value of netting and the value of some bird uh, abatement devices that year. But that was my first commercial harvest. <laughs> it was one of those, uh, of those heartbreaking things that farmers run into, and there's a lot of heartbreaking things that farmers run into, but uh, that was kind of tough, the way that that happened. Um, so the next year we ended up, because we only had three acres, we ended up netting the whole vineyard, and we ended up netting it for about the next two or three years, and then we put another three acres in. I think we netted that, so we netted six acres, but then when we went to nine, 10, 11, 12, it started to get too big to commercially viably net it all. Uh, it's just too labor intensive to do. But luckily, uh, Mother Nature flipped the coin on us a little bit, and between 2010 and today, with the warming that we've had, the migration of the starlings has slowly backed up into later and later into October. So instead of swarming us in September, they're swarming us in the end of October, beginning of November now. And, you, and if all things line up, uh, we'll be out of the vineyard and the grapes will be gone by then. Uh, so we can we can take care of the bird abatement with um, propane cannons and a, and a little shotgun. We'll, we'll keep, and Ruby. Ruby. Ruby runs the birds out. Uh, so we really haven't had a significant bird issue since that 2010 issue. We, lear we learned how to deal with that one the hard way. Mm -hmm. So that, that was my first commercial vintage and commercial harvest. It uh, was really heartbreaking. But uh, we've, we've done pretty well since then. And then, the, and then the, for the next, uh, from 10 to last year, there were pretty much Goldilocks kind of vintages. Every one from 11, 12, all the way through 20, well, 20 was another issue. We'll get back to that in a minute. Uh, but as far as harvest dates goes, until last year, uh, it was pretty warm uh, with the harvest. You, you had, the rain wasn't driving you out of the vineyard, although 11 drove you out. Mm -hmm. um, so we had, we had the option of letting it hang, and Drew Voigt is a winemaker that likes to let the fruit hang till the rain's eminent, and then he says, okay, pull it off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and last year, uh, with that three weeks of October that we had, we got a good harvest in, but last year was a tough year. It was a nervous year, uh, but it turned out to be a great vintage. And then the other vintage of real note was 20, mm -hmm. the year of the smoke, and Ribbon Ridge got extremely lucky in that one as well. We were right on the seam, uh, right above my house, 
to the south was the end of the world. From the, above my house to the north, there was blue sky. We were right on the seam. And then there was also a uh, fire on the Shehala Mountains that went directly south, about two miles east of us. And it didn't blow with the, the, the upper wind that usually blows to the east was blowing to the west and bringing the cascade smoke about 3,000 feet above us. And then the prevailing ground wind was blowing to the south and took that that fire out of the Shayla Mountains right into Dundee. And we were sort of in this blue vortex. And you looked up and we had blue sky for four or five days. It just went sailing over. And the, the corrosiveness of smoke is directly related to how close and how fresh the smoke is. And so by the time the wind stopped and it settled on us, it was five days, six days old. And it wasn't fun to sit around in, but its damaging qualities to the grapes had mitigated substantially. So we did the normal fire drill that everybody else, no pun intended, the normal drills uh, that everybody did in 20, we did bucket fermentations. We watched the fermentations through the winery. We watched them going into the barrels. Uh, and when our, and not, all those showed no sign of, of damage. Uh, the test that went into the lab, and the lab was really backed up because everybody wanted to test. And you really didn't know what your chemistry was till three or four months after, you know, that fermentations and things that were in the barrel. Uh, our test came back and said, well, you've got smoke, but it's really very low. And, and depending on where the customer's perceptin is on their spectrum, you probably won't have an issue here. So the one thing we, the one thing that we still weren't real comfortable with was. Smoke is known to two, three, four years down the road, all of a sudden appear in your wine. Uh, and we didn't see any now, but we go, well, should we spend the money to bottle it and then three years from now have a mess? And Drew said, well, there's an enzyme you can use to hit your wine with to release all the smoke in it. And we'll know today what it's going to be like three to four years from now. So we took our 12 barrels that we do every year and hit it with the enzyme and then took it through Drew's really good palate. He and Jessica and his crew have uh, extremely good palates uh, and nobody can pick it up. Mm -hmm. And then in fact, we just did, I just am now releasing my 20s and I took it over to Drew and Jess and, and uh, uh, Cassidy, who's also over at uh, Harper Voigt <clears throat> and had them, they always helped me with my tasting notes. And they said they couldn't tell that was a 20 if I hadn't told them it was a 20. It's got no sign of smoke in it at all. So two miles further to the south, it was a disaster. Right here, we just got very lucky. So there's so much luck involved <laughs> with farming and what, what happened, particularly in the wine business, that uh, we were just really fortunate to have a, have a great product. It was, 20 was one of the hottest years on record to that point, and it, you know, they continued to get hotter, but it was a phenomenal vintage, and the poor growers and wineries that lost their crop that year lost a really good vintage, and it's just terrible that uh, I'm the only one with a good, no, I'm not the only one. <laughs> there are a lot of people that have got good Pinots out of 20, but uh, the, the battle I'm fighting with 20 is the, per, the market perception. Everybody says it's tainted. So I've got uh, an 18 and a 19 estate wine left in my flights, and I tell them, well, we're going to drink some 18, we're going to drink some 19s, and we're going to drink some 20s today, and I'm not going to tell you what's what until you've tasted it. And so we go through it all, and by the end of, end of it, they're all going, I can't tell what's 20. Everything's great. And then I tell them what's what. Mm -hmm. So, And I've done it the other way, where I said, here's what you're getting. And when I tell them it's a 20, they say, oh, I taste smoke in there. It's so much perception involved with uh, uh, what your mind's telling you you're going to find in the wine that it, it works when I tell them, when I don't tell them what's in there, they're happy and it's fine. Um, so anybody else who's got that issue, that's the way to do it, is to not tell them what you're pouring them. <laughs> and, and they kind of like that. They like to be tested. They like to say, yeah, don't tell me. Let me see what I come up with. Mm -hmm. And so I give them the glass and I kind of tell them by after they've had each glass what I poured them. Um, but I'll make, I have a list of what they're going to drink, and but I do it out of order. So they think, you know, the first one says 18, the second one says 19, but there's a 20 that I pour in there and they go, it's young, but it's fresh, it's great. And I go, well, that's the 20. It's <laughs> amazing. Yeah. You mentioned, obviously, luck uh, comes up a lot in this interview and in all of our interviews, there's always luck involved. Tell me yeah. about, uh, especially for someone with your background, uh, getting used to that, getting used to not being able to control the variables. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, there, there are a lot of things you can control and a lot of things, you know, the farming side, 
you've got the responsibility to be on time and to do the things you need to do to optimize what that grape is going to come off the vine. And then you've got to just ride with Mother, Mother Nature and let her do what she's going to do. I find, uh, you know, the, the, the effects of Mother Nature are just wondrous to go through. When I pour an 18 and a 19 and a 20 off of the same more or less blocks of the vineyard, uh, done in the same protocols, you, well, you get two layers there. You get the vintage effect, and then you get the aging effect. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're both very influential on our wines. Um, but the commonality in, in Ribbon Ridge, and particularly this vineyard, is there no matter what the vintage is. There's, a, there's some attributes in the wine that are sort of vintage independent. And then there are some things that are vintage dependent. Mm -hmm. And the things that are vintage independent on Ribbon Ridge, and in this vineyard particularly, is um, there's an earthy, mushroomy kind of uh, walk in the woods attribute to Ribbon Ridge Pinot Noir. If you if you brought all the Ribbon Ridge winemakers together and said, "What makes a Ribbon Ridge Pinot Noir?" They go, "It's that kind of that earthy, mushroomy, musky smell that's in the wine, and that's kind of from the sedimentary soils." But then, what makes each vineyard a little different is what the what the aromatics are doing. Um, how red is the fruit? How dark is the fruit? What what fruit is coming up. Is it the raspberries, is it the strawberries, is it the cherry? Uh, and then the really unique part about this vineyard on Ribbon Ridge is it's extremely floral. It's got a hibiscus nature to it and it's got uh, rose petals and violets and all these floral attributes that come onto it that is, is and no matter what vintage, you're going to get that. I think the fruits move more from vintage to vintage, and the floral is always there. The fruits are there, but is it red or is it cherry or is it pruny? What is it? And um, that moves around from vintage to vintage. And then I think the viscosity of the wine is more age dependent than anything. The younger it is, the lighter, the, the sharper it is. It's my uh, assistant. <laughs> Ruby, no barking during the interview. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But uh, it's, it's, it's fascinating. I really find it fascinating. Then, then I also find it fascinating that uh, um, I, think, I think the debates and discussions on Tawar are, are very interesting. But I, I've kind of, over the time I've spent in winemaking and in the vineyard, I think it's more of the chemistry that the grape brings with it into the winery. And it's not necessarily dirt, it's what's happening in the physiological attribute of the, of the berry that gives the fermentation a platform for the yeast to work on. And what that chemical platform is varies from vineyard to vineyard to vineyard. And that gives you the unique terroir. And that chemistry is certainly driven by what the plant's doing in the ground and what the little critters in the ground are giving it. And then its aspect and its temp, you know, all the wind, the mm -hmm. how you talk to it, how often you visit it, what your dog does while she's out there. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it all kind of adds up. It's it's and it's very fun. And uh, that compared to my financing world is, you know, it's out of my control, but it's somewhat constant mm -hmm. in in its sphere. It's 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 kind of zenny, you know. It's got it's got things that you can't control, but it's there all the time, that energy, that thing that's there. And I find that fascinating in the whole business. And, it's, and I think any farmer would tell you that, that there's an energy in the farm, uh, there's an energy in your crops, there's an energy in your ground, there's an energy all around you that's impacting what's happening on you. And good luck influencing that. But you can, you can, you know, over time, you can enhance or suppress, I think, biodynamics is all about that energy. And I'm not really a biodynamic person. I'm, I'm live certified and I'm organic and I do do biodynamic things. I do compost, mm -hmm. um, but I do organic sprays as opposed to biodynamic sprays. Um, but I, I think there's, you know, there's, there's logic. I don't know if there's logic, there's spirituality to all the celestial gravitational things that are going on out there as well. But I don't, I don't do things based on is, the, is it a low tide or a high tide today? Is it a full moon or a low moon today? I, I um, respect and understand those things. I, I really don't understand them as well as the really strong bio uh, technicians do. Uh, but there are a lot of biodynamic farmers around us that have great crops and do a great job. Mm -hmm. I'm a believer in it. I just don't 
uh, put a lot of effort into that side. I'm, I want a good, clean, organic vineyard mm -hmm. is what my focus is on. Mm -hmm. And whenever I do a compost, and I usually do a compost every year, I put biodynamic preps into it, and then we treat it and you know try to keep it all within the biodynamic, just because I think it enhances it. And I do believe that the critters in your ground are what's doing it all. It's that zillion, zillions of things that are underneath our feet that are really making your vineyard do what it does. And, and it's directly related to the soil and what little critters are gonna be happy there. So I try to keep those guys happy, guys and girls. <laughs> So we talked earlier about the first grapes. Tell me about the first time you had wine that was made with your grapes. Well, the, as I, I think I mentioned that we've always made a house wine off of that field blend. Um, and I, so I've also, the, well, the, the, the fun thing about that field blend, having seven different clones on nine different rows, and we pick it all at the same time. And s clones typically don't all ripen at the same time. So I usually try to go to the end of the ripening season and get, get all of them ripened. So if anything, some are maybe just a hair over ripened. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I try not to go to the, or air to the unripened side. Mm -hmm. Unripened fruit is much less behaving or pleasant than the over ripened fruit. So that particular block has been uh, just a real fun one to make. It's, I've always done it indigenously. I've always put it through malolactic fermentation. Uh, we just did one fermenter down in the basement, all by hand. I've got a little itty bitty distemmer and a little itty bitty press, and I put it into a four by four fermenter. And we, the whole family, would, it was kind of the family project. They all come out. We'd all get our five gallon buckets, and we'd take the dogs out, and we'd spend a day doing that. Um, and then at the end of the fermentation, Kay would put on a pair of boots, and we'd put her in the fermenter, and she'd bring it all out in five gallon buckets, and then we'd put it through our little press and age it, put a tower of pallets up and put the stainless steel tank up, and then I'd borrow a bottler from a neighbor and a corker from a neighbor, and away we go. So it was kind of fun to do that as a family thing, mm -hmm. um, but it was definitely a very very, very good learning thing because you're, you're in that fermenter two or three times a day, because I'm living right on it, and the house would just smell wonderful for that, until the fruit flies discovered it, and it was always great to have in the house. I kind of miss that, not having that in the house anymore, now that the, uh, we're using Drew's winery. But, uh, so you, you just kind of, you notice subtle things, and each fermentation would kind of kick off, depending on how much yan it had, and how much, uh, nutrients were in there, they would all go a little bit differently depending on uh, how the grape chemistry was sitting in that must. Every year, I got to appreciate that and what that must platform does to your minds. Um, and I kind of, you know, tightened my protocol through time. Uh, when I did what, how hard I punched it down, how long I let it cold soak, how long I let it sit in the alcohol at the end, how hard I, I got, because I, I didn't have a lot of storage room, I really didn't press. I took everything through a press, a little press, <laughs> a little bucket press, um, but we were just trying to get the free run out of it. We really didn't press it hard at all, and that gave us our barrels in the way we went. So I never really had to work too hard with it. You take that hard press, because we never had hard press or light press, um, and that, you know, in, in a big winery, that's a big decision. Now, where's that pressed wine gonna go, and what's it gonna get put with? Um, I never really had to deal with that here, but it was it's more just family fun, just to get everybody involved with it, and then to be able to drink the results of our of our project. And I've still got some of the 15 that I did back then, and to pull that out today, that's an eight-year-old Pinot, and it's really kind of at its prime right now. Versus I'm uh, I release wines after three years. I hold my wines for three years that Drew makes for me, so I'm just now pouring the 20s. And, to, and it's one of the little benefits I give my, I don't show the TTB this comment, but I let uh, some of my wine club members taste that. I call it my bootleg wine because it wasn't done under TTB, it was house wine. Uh, and it's at its prime. And most of the wine that I sell is three years old. I've got some four years old and some five years old now, but they're still not at their prime. And to be able to show a customer what an eight, nine year old Pinot tastes like and what it does on your mouth, it's kind of fun to do that. Mm -hmm. And then, then to be able to tell them, well, that was made right where you're sitting, right in that distemmer and that press and all that kind of stuff is kind of fun. But uh, it helps me also today, I go for 
I, when I deliver the grapes to Drew at the winery, I usually stay for the sorting, watch it go into the fermenter. Uh, and I've got a kind of a fun thing going on right now. I've got a 19-year-old grandson who worked the crush for Drew this year. So he was out here helping me uh, position the grapes and getting them ready to get picked and then followed them in the winery. And he took them all the way through. He cleaned the barrels that, you know, he did the whole thing. He did the whole intern thing. But anyway, it was kind of fun to have him involved with that. But I um, pretty much am a hands off once I hand it, once I take it to the winery, uh, because they're the pros. They know what they're doing. Uh, they know the style I want. In fact, I think in two weeks we're going to go over and blend the 22s and that'll be the first time since the yeast has dropped out of them that I really get a good taste mm -hmm. of them. I tasted them when they were going into the barrels mm -hmm. uh, and they're so yeasty that right then that you really can't tell where they're going to, you can get a hint of where they're going to go. Um, but it's right now that you really, really start to go, do we have something or don't we have something? And we usually have something. Yeah. <laughs> This vineyard is not brought, not let us down yet. It's all it's kind of how good is it, and which one's going to go into the reserve. And sometimes that's not easy to pick the which one's going to go in the reserve because they they're all reserves, mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. which is kind of fun. And when you're only doing 350 cases, it's the other the other side of that coin is out of 12 barrels that are taken from one, two, three, four. Well, I, I hit a little bit of almost every block out there. Um, so I've got a variety of clones and a variety of little places in the vineyard where I'm pulling it out. So the barrels are very, very different. And it's amazing how different the three wines that we bottle when we blend are mm -hmm. coming from the same vineyard at the more or less the same time and having the same protocol done to them, how different they come out. Uh, field blend's extremely different because it's co-fermented. Mm -hmm. And then the reserve is usually a pomard with maybe a little bit of 115 in it to give it a little bit of structure. And then the estate is everything else. It's the other eight barrels that we don't put into those 250 or 250 case runs. Uh, and it is literally ribbon ridge in your glass. In fact, the, the first wines we did, I had Paul, Paul Gruget of uh, the Wine Enthusiast review them for him. And his comment was, this is ribbon ridge in your glass. This is, this is captures ribbon ridge to a T. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. For your first commercial release, that was a nice review to get. <laughs> <laughs> I bet so. He liked the he liked the joy block too. That field blend he gave that a ninety four and an editor's choice. Every year that's got an editor's choice out of wine enthusiasts. It's so unique and it's so complex. It's so layered with all those clones in it. Uh, it's really a fun one, I, and it, it is, it's a fun one re for me to educate my. Uh, tasters on too. I'll do what's called, I don't know if you've ever, heard, anybody's ever explained to you the first nose, second nose. Have you heard of that one? So when you pour the wine into a glass, just let it sit, no air, and you smell it without any air in it, that's called the first nose. And before it oxygenates, it can be, you can pick up those musky, earthy tones. And then as soon as you oxygenate it, that's the second nose, all that perfume and all that fruit is going to come flying out of it. And, it. and with a field blend, those two extremes are dramatic. Mm -hmm. It's like earthy, whoa, I've got all these flowers and perfumes coming into my nose. And it's a fun one to do with that wine. And then that wine is, it oxygenates over the, you know, the five or 10 minutes that a customer's tasting it, or as you have that bottle at a, at a meal or when you drink, those clones are just tumbling in there and evolving in the glass. It's just a really cool wine. And I've, and I've talked to Drew about, well, you know, that wine is so good, I, I want to plant another field blend. He said, well, you won't get the same thing you get out of that block. It's just, it's dirt and it's time and it's place and it's all those things. So you can do it, but you won't get the same wine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> good lesson for all of us, I yeah. guess. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you mentioned in 2018 uh, the decision to, to start the brand. And so tell me about um, what what you wanted to create, what, what you were hoping at that point would be the sort of the legacy of that brand. What would people know the brand for? Well, mostly I was just kind of reaching, in chapter three I was getting to the middle of the book or towards, you know, I was getting to the point where uh, I only have so many more vintages in front of me, so I wanted to start my own brand and get it going just so I could evolve it and get to it, and hopefully I've got a few more vintages in front of me. Uh, but that was one of the big motivators to, to do the brand. Um, but what I was wanted to do was just show off the time and the place of the vintage that we've got here. And our wines are trying to very much connect the place and the time and the grapes and all those things together. Um, 
it's it's really a small, um, extremely bonique, boutique, extremely, you know, everything we do is by hand. It's very, very small. So you, you don't have to, you, you don't lose things. You get some really interesting focus at that level. And like I said, the three different wines we do are very, very different, even though they're coming out of the same vintage mm -hmm. and out of the same vineyard. So technically the same terroir, but it's how we're combining the clonal material uh, to get the different uh, wines that we get. So what I, w what I wanted to do was, was start to share that and connect customers. And I was looking for, the, I, I just wanted to start to share what I've got with people other than the three or four big wineries that I sell the grapes to. Uh, they have luckily, um, our grapes are distinctive enough where we almost everybody gives us a vineyard designate. So we go into eminent domain and it's Lichtenwalter Vineyard and wherever we go it's usually that. Some of it gets blended into their bigger wines depending on, on where it is. So you can taste it but it's only that. Usually there are one or two clones that they're working with versus I've got six or five or six clones in the vineyard and then seven in the field block and the field blend. Um, so to get, get those and uh, to get just estate wines uh, I think makes a statement. It makes a difference into what the customer experiences. Mm -hmm. And then the, the thing we, I really strive for here is to connect the customer to Lichtenwalter Vineyard. It's just not the wine, but think about what it took to get that into your glass and what you're tasting and, and help them understand the year's worth of farming or the 15 years worth of farming it's taken to get that glass to do it. It's just not what happens in the winery. It's what happens all year long out here. And then what happens in the winery and then how old it, all these things add up to ha give what you're, and then your mood for the day customer or whatever it is, uh, is all, in all affecting what you're doing. Um, and so we try to connect. So when they take the wine home, hopefully, and they open it back in, Georgia or Illinois or where I've got a lot of customers from around the country uh, that they reflect back to here and bring back the time and place and Ruby uh, back into their uh, their tasting experience and they do I get notes from my customers all the time where you know we we sat down with a bottle of wine on the couch and we were right back at the vineyard that type of thing and that that's what I like to do is that those connections of all those things of people time and place are, are really kind of cool yeah. And, and that's one thing I've learned over time, is how all those conne how important all those connections are. And you start out just with the connections in your network, and then you get a customer base that connects to it all. Uh, it's just all those little connections that are really kind of cool. Well, my next question is going to be about selling wine. So obviously, you don't you don't make a lot. Mm -hmm. um, tell me about your sort of strategies for selling wine and. Um, what you have found to be uh, the, the most effective ways to get people to connect to this place and to this time? Well, we're so, we're so small. Um, my primary um, sales channel is direct to consumer. And because we're so small, uh, as Rich will attest, there's room to park two cars in my driveway. <laughs> uh, I, I have to do everything by appointment. And I do occasionally get somebody who drives by and sees our little sign and says, calls me up and wants to come in. But most of my initial customers come from tour groups. So I've worked with, uh, I've got about six or seven or eight tour groups that I've established a relationship with. And when they, and most of them spend time uh, kind of interviewing their, their customers that they're going to bring out on a tour and ask them what they want to see. And when they run into one that says, I want a small off the path, uh, off the beaten path gem, a mom and pop kind of thing that's really small. They bring them to me and they're ready for that versus, you know, if they want to just go on a bachelorette party, if they want to just go, you know, see the big wineries, I'm not the fit for that. They, uh, the best ones that work are when they do that. So the initial interface with 90% of my customers are through tour groups. Uh, and I, we have a pretty high conversion rate into our wine club and a relatively high um, uh, relatively low attrition rate. Uh, we do get attrition, but I think the industry attrition rate is like 20 to 25 percent, and we're like we're under 10 percent uh, just because of that connection that we get, mm -hmm. and our pricing is relatively uh, uh, affordable and reasonable. 
um, for the value of the wine that you're getting. But again, it's, it's, it's just all those connections that we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. So the tasting process here is not a staff person. It's not uh, you know, somebody who's not vested in the operation. It's me. 100% of the wine tastings are done with me. So they get virtually what you're hearing on this tape. In, a, in an hour and a half with the wines, they get that whole background story. Mm -hmm. uh, and you see the, the tour guide operator has gotten to know my spiel, and so they kind of pepper the group that they come. I ask him about how he got into it. I ask him about his dog. Ask, you know. <laughs> so they come loaded with all these questions to kind of get into how we got into it and why we're doing what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And then we give them sort of the geological background and why the wine's the way it is and kind of give them that education, which a lot of people from out of state really kind of find fascinating. People from in-state find that fascinating. And, the, and it's usually a new education for them, so you try not to get too geeky with them, but give them enough ammo where they can really go, oh, I understand why the wine's doing that now. Or I understand why it's doing this and where that's coming from. Versus, did you put cherries in this wine? How'd that get in there? Uh, and, so that's kind of fun. <laughs> but it, it's, uh, it's, and it's also uh, uh, extremely momentum driven. So the first, first year was kind of quiet. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the wine touring groups got to know me and what I do. Uh, second year got more to it. And now, in, this is our third year of tasting wine. We're, we're, you know, we're gonna probably double business this year, and then we'll be just about maxed out when we when we get up to 400 cases a year or so. Mm -hmm. We'll be right there, and uh, and my my goal is to kinda I'd like to just be wine club based and just have a network of people that know us, know the wines, and get them on a regular basis and come out to see new stuff, come out to play with Ruby, come out to walk the vineyard, and as opposed to having new people come in. But you're always going to have to have a because there's. Mm -hmm. People going out the door as people are coming in the door. Mm -hmm. So you're always going to have some turnover. Um, but my goal is to build that connection with customers over time so that they appreciate the vintages and what's going on in the vineyard from vintage to vintage, not just what makes Lichtenwalter Vineyard special, uh, mm -hmm. but what made Lichtenwalter Vineyard in 23 special. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. and, they, and it's, uh, you know, they don't, in an hour and a half, you can only get so much information into them without making them glaze over and fall over. Uh, but some of them are just intrigued by it and uh, really want to know all that stuff and follow it up. Some of them go, ah, uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. Keep on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's kind of fun to, to get to that level with your customers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'll talk about the neighborhood a little bit here. Obviously, you mentioned Ribbon Ridge being a key draw for you uh, mm -hmm. when you came in here. Tell me about what this looked like when you got here and what uh, how Ribbon Ridge has grown up since you've been here. Well, when we got here in 2003, um, Utopia had just been planted, uh, so it was not producing yet. Um, we were hazelnuts. Uh, Trisatum was hazelnuts. What was Redmond was hazelnuts, and right about 2003, 4, all those hazelnuts came down. So, let's see, 15, 45, about 70 acres of hazelnuts came out just about the same time for um, all of us. Mm -hmm. There's only one hazelnut orchard left, and it's right up on the hill right there, and it's shaking in its trunk, because it's probably going to be, it's a great vineyard site. It will make a great vineyard site, uh, and, but uh, it's, it's destined to come out. So all the hazelnuts are gone. Highest and best use of the land on Ribbon Ridge has, has evolved into um, the, the vineyards and the wineries and it's got you know it's got a history. You talk to some of the people that have been here for 40 or 50 years and it you know it was in livestock for a while and then it was in uh, I think it was in cherries and fruits for a while and then it went into different nuts for a while and now all the orchards are, are, are down and it's primarily vineyard land. Although Ribbon Ridge has enough um, non-vineyard people on it. We're so small but we have equestrian people. We have um, we have a, a whiskey brand on the on the ridge. We have a couple now, Trisatum's in it as well. But we've got some diversity within us, so it's just not a, a blanket of vineyards. And then we've got hundreds of acres of woods on the ridge as well for that biodiversity. Behind us is Camp Telecom. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and that's, I think it's 60 or 70 acres of just woods, uh, and it'll never change. And I've got 15 acres of woods in the back of my property, so it's a great buffer, it's a great place for the hawks to hang out and the coyotes to go hang out and the deer, deer to go hang out back there instead of in my vineyard. Um, so all that biodiversity uh, is great for the ridge and has stayed, uh, it's just changed over from a, from a nut production area into a uh, grape production area. Um, so they're, they're an, um, most of the vineyard owners, I'd say half of us have come on the ridge since 2000. You know, Tanel was here, uh, the Etzels were here, um, they were some of the early ones, and of course Harry, and Harry Pedri Peterson Nedry up at the top uh, was one of the first vineyards to plant. Uh, and then starting in 2000, that second wave came in, and we were sort of that second wave that came in. Um, and now, um, so it's probably when, I'm, I think there, I think there's about 30 vineyards, maybe 35 vineyards on the ridge now. And there might be a dozen wineries or tasting rooms. And when we came on, it was, or for, it was a third of that, or if not a quarter of that. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's, it's grown, and it's, it's kind of, that extrapolates to the Oregon wine industry as a whole. It's, we're kind of mirroring that, but we're so small. We are, I think we are the smallest, although there's new AVAs coming on all the time. There might be a smaller one out there now, but in 2005, uh, when we got designated an AVA, we were the smallest one in Oregon. Um, and because of our great ancient sea bottom soils, and the elegant wines we make, we score really, really well. And I think, I think somebody somewhere watches how the AVA score, and I've heard a number of times that Ribbon Ridge scores really, really well. It's one of the highest scoring ones. Dundee's got more wineries and more scores than we do, but I think we're neck and neck with them. And of course, Beaufort does quite well. Yeah, they, uh, they lead the wine spectator all the time, and Mike and Mike over there uh, do a great job, and we're glad to have them as neighbors. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned this kind of mirroring the, the larger wine industry being a microcosm of the larger Oregon industry and its growth in the last 20 years. Tell me about your initial impressions of Oregon wine as you were at Chemeketa, as you were kind of mm -hmm. getting into the game. Uh, what, did you, what did you notice about the Oregon wine industry and what have you seen change in the, since you've been part of it? I think, you know, I've been in it long enough to where the initial guard that was here in 2000 when I came in, the... Uh, um, they were still, the California Cowboys were still leading, leading the charge at that time. Uh, and they were, they were mostly really punching the edge, really. They were doing some really interesting things, but the really, the guard that's in here now is a little bit more technically trained, I think, than, and they're definitely more specialized in what Oregon needs versus some of the California attributes that they brought up, the, the spacing and some of the techniques that they use initially. They learn through, you know, uh, blood, sweat, and tears how to, how to optimize the Oregon Pinots, and are, particularly that's really evident in the Chardonnays that are just now really hitting their, their strides uh, because they, they, they came with California techniques and they said, well, work down there or work up here and it took them a while to figure out that it didn't work up here and when we came here that guard was still very much here but they had they had evolved into we're Oregon winemakers we're not California winemakers anymore so we were lucky enough to be taught by and be able to watch their example and you know you got to take your hat off to what they did and how they did it and we're standing on their shoulders you know we really are um, and very thankful for them. And that's one of, that's the other thing that I've really noticed about the wine industry in Ribbon Ridge. I think Ribbon Ridge is not unique in this regard. You hear a lot of people tell about how cooperative and how cooperative the Oregon wine industry is, and it is. It, it's extremely, everybody's looking out for everybody else and they'll do anything for you to help you when you need help. Uh, they pretty much, you know, farming is pretty much islands. They don't, tend to tell another farmer how to farm, 
But if that farmer asks them or needs something from them, they're all there. They're there to do whatever they can do to help them. I think that that's one thing I've really noticed about Ribbon Ridge particularly is no, not too many people will come over and tell you, you shouldn't be doing it that way. They'll let you do it and figure it out that it doesn't work. And then when you come over and they go, why didn't that work? They'll tell you. <laughs> and, and, and they'll be very kind about it and very generous with it. And uh, everybody kind of does their own thing. Um, but uh, everybody's trying to help everybody else out. Uh, Ribbon Ridge is, uh, most of the people that are here that came in from 2000 on are relatively in the same sort of phase of life. I don't know if I'd call it chapter three for them. Some are in chap more in chapter two. It's kind of their main profession versus their retirement profession. But there's a few of us retirement guys on the, on the hill that are here to retire. A few of the guys that were here when I got here that are now in the retirement phase and are looking for succession plans and ways to move that to the younger generation. But the commonality is we're all trying to optimize what Ribbon Ridge is and, uh, and to help market our wines from a, just a holistic, healthy, um, quality point of view, which is great to have around you, uh, as opposed in the finance world where it's that's my client. No, it's my client. Yeah. There's, no, there's nothing cutthroat about the Oregon wine industry at all, which I, I really enjoy. And uh, everybody's so kind. And it's really kind of cool. Is we did, uh, or the first one I had been involved in, we did a trade tasting at Mike Etzel's new facility over at Secretur last, I think it was in September. And everybody, just about everybody on Ribbon Ridge had a table and the trade was brought to uh, wine writers, restaurants, uh, small wine shops, those type of people were, it wasn't the public, it was the trade that came through. And so we were all kind of next to each other and there were dead moments where you could walk over and talk to your neighbor or talk to somebody you hadn't met before on the ridge and taste their wine and it was just a great time. Mm -hmm. uh, and the best time afterwards was I, think it was, I think it was Ken Wright who was in charge of martini hour after the event and that, and that social event was, was just mm -hmm. classic. It's mm -hmm. classic Ribbon Ridge stuff. One thing I miss that we need to do again sometime is when we first came onto the ridge, we would do, uh, in December usually, we would do a progressive dinner. And it was primarily to thank our neighbors for letting us shoot our propane cannons off and our shotguns and all, all that disruption we make before harvest uh, that the non-wine people have to tolerate. We would start at one winery with hors d'oeuvres and then go to another winery for dinner and another winery for dessert uh, and just have the collection of, or, of uh, Ribbon Ridge people on it. It was, was a great, great time to get together. And I, I think we just, uh, we lost steam about five or six, seven years ago on that. We need to get that going again. and. Uh, just a way to say thank you to our neighbors mm -hmm. for letting us do what we do. Because mm -hmm. there's a lot of equestrian people up here. There's a lot of just people who live here mm -hmm. that uh, like to live in the country. Or, um, there's a hazelnut farmer left. And uh, uh, those people, we're not, we're not at odds with them, um, but because they don't have the same focus we have, we just have to appreciate that we might be stepping on their toe. The thing that we, we have to watch out for, and, and you get a little undertone of that, is we're bringing traffic onto the ridge. We're bringing people onto the ridge that they would just as soon didn't come up. Uh, so we need to be thankful to them and let them know we appreciate uh, tolerating us. <laughs> and, they, and they seem to seem to do just fine. But it never hurts to say thank you. Never hurts to say thank you. Yeah. What do you see coming next for the Oregon wine industry? What's, what does the future look like? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I think uh, the momentum and growth that we have and the expansion that we're going under, I don't see any signs of it slowing down at the moment. And the capacity for the vineyards that are being planted to be assimilated into the wineries and the product to be so sold appears to be maintaining its momentum. Uh, you know, you worry about getting overplanted at some point or overproduced at some point, but I think there's a long way to go before we get that. The, the, the good thing is that there is a limit, right? There's a limit to how many vineyards you can plant. There's a limit to how many quality vineyard plant sites you can. So at some point we're going to run out and uh, so there is a cap someplace in the future. So you, you're just worried about the what you see in some of the other crops, like you see it in in, um, 
and the blueberries. You see it in some of the other fruits where it's, it's got a little overplanted, uh, and then you get it in other states. And that we, we're kind of unique in that, like British Columbia and California and South American blueberries can all flood into our market, and our consumers eat all those. Uh, wines from all around the world come into our market, but it's amazing how much the Oregon wine produced in Oregon is consumed right in Oregon or right around Oregon. Uh, and it's, it's very, it's, I don't know if it's unique, but it's, it's good. I think it's good. And we have an opportunity to kind of spread that out across the country and the world, which we're slowly doing. But uh, there's so many small producers that I think the, the barrier there is still the uh, interstate um, hassles you have to go through to ship wine from state to state. That kind of slows down your ability to get your product around the country. And luckily we have a couple of shipping people in the area that have put up those permits and those licenses so that we can go through their channels. And like it would be uh, just administratively impossible for me to have a license to sell my wine in every state mm -hmm. to sell 300, you know, it just doesn't make sense. Or the few little amount of wine I sell into each state, it just doesn't justify the cost of the effort to do that. I would have to pick three or four states and say, that's the only ones I can ship to. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to take it yourself if you want to get there. But I do have some avenues to do that. And to the Newburgh um, mailroom mm -hmm. does a lot of that kind of stuff, which is really good for us. Uh, but everybody uses them, so it gets a little backed up. But uh, <laughs> uh, the price you have to pay for it. But I see, uh, I see continued improvement to quality. Uh, I think winemaking techniques continue to improve. Uh, I think... Um, the, the direct-to-consumer uh, momentum that really took off in the COVID you know, realm is, is, gonna, is here to stay. Um, I think that probably the biggest difference that we're going to have to all get better with, and I've got a grandson that's going to help me with this, is the whole social media side of the world and how that marketing all works and mm -hmm. how that all goes. Uh, I can post a picture of Ruby on Instagram, but that's about as far as I can get with it. But he, my 19-year-old, oh, give it to me, Grandpa. I'll take care of it. So that's what we do. But I see, uh, I see that as kind of the, the next big umbrella. The other, the other thing that's kind of interesting about wine is that it's as you get the different generations um, and as the baby boomer or the older generation is sort of aging out, um, that is the younger generation going to be wine consumers or are they going to be cocktail consumers or what they're going to be? And I'm kind of of the, of the mindset that that's important, but it's more, it's more on what segment has the discretionary income to buy the wine than what their consumption patterns are as a generation. Because uh, I get young consumers and I get old consumers and everybody in between. And the key is, do they have the discretionary income to, to drink good wine? Mm -hmm. And that's the real differentiator for me on the, on the consumer, at least the small little group that I deal with. If you're big and you've got 5,000, 6,000, 10,000 cases, you've got different marketing layers and focuses than I've got to deal with. Um, so I don't see that as a real challenge. Uh, I think there'll always be a healthy group out there with discretionary income. So tell me about, what, as you look ahead for the vineyard and the brand, what, what comes next and what are you sort of hoping for long term with those things? Well, the next thing for Lichtenwalter Vineyard is we just planted Chardonnay. It's on its second year, so in another two or three years we'll add a Chardonnay to our lineup. And as I, I think I mentioned earlier, I think Oregon has really found its legs with Chardonnay. I can't wait to get a Chardonnay into, uh, into the lineup because I think Oregon I've had a couple uh, of the neighbors Chardonnays, and they're just spectacular. They're really good. So for my brand, it, it's bringing that in. Um, also, you know, I'm not getting any younger, and my wife would like to go to Mexico more often. So <laughs> I might, I'd like to get the the growth part to a plateau where I don't have to work it quite as hard. So it is more club oriented and it's less day to day, and it's more event focused, so that I can have more time to enjoyed the last couple of pages of my chapter three in places other than on the vineyard, although the vineyard's not a bad place to hang out. This is not a bad place to be, not a bad place to spend your time. Um, 
So for Lichtenwalter Vineyard, I, I don't want to grow it any more than it is. I'm, I'm going to add another SKU into the 350. I'm going to go up to about 450, and uh, Ruby's going to get her own label starting. And uh, she was in 21, so I'll serve it in another two years. And it's a little different blend. Of, it's a Vidensville 777 blend that I don't have in my lineup currently. Uh, that'll be really nice. And, th and then I'll stop. I just don't want to get any bigger than that. Um, We'll see where the grandson goes. He's kind of interested in it. And I think my, you know, the, generally the family is very supportive. They've got their own careers and their own things going on, which is good. My oldest son, who's got the horticultural degree in his own landscaping business, is at the point of his career where he's looking to come back more and more into the vineyard. And I'm uh, hoping to get him to help take over some of the tractor work that I've been doing so I can spend more time in the tasting room. Uh, and then I'd also like to get, I'd like to find a way to do events for the club at some point, uh, despite the physical limitations, where we do a spring and a fall pickup, uh, where I need additional servers and the family could help with their permits and do stuff like that. I've just got to find a way to park them and get them in here, uh, but I think I can park them down on the barn and get a, a hay wagon and bring them up to the house or whatever. But uh, that's kind of where I want to go with the brand and with the, with the Lichtenwalter experience. Mm -hmm. But I definitely want it to be an on-site, mm -hmm. tangible, feel it, taste it, touch it experience mm -hmm. versus you're never going to see my wine on a, on a Fred Meyer shelf. Uh, you might find it in a little boutique store if that lines up right because there can be a special relationship between that boutique store and their buyer mm -hmm. where that story can get told. Uh, but that's key to our success, I think, is that it, that story goes with the bottle. So that's kind of where I see it going. And, you know, compared to the 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 case neighbors I have, that's, you know, that's just a micro. I'm just a little, I'm just a little drop in the bucket. And it's a very different experience than you get at theirs. The wines are equally as pleasant and as good all through the neighborhood. But it's just the experience the customer has, whether it's with a staff person or whether it's with the owner. It's a very different experience. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then whether you're in a real fancy big old winery. Some people just love that big winery experience and big tasting room experience. I do. I like to go to Domain, or doing uh, Willamette Domain and you know, hang out at that big winery. And those are cool. but. Uh, I like the one-on-one, the -on -one more uh, personal experience in the wine. It just makes the whole experience uh, more interesting. Anything else on the horizon for you? You mentioned kind of chapter three here. Yeah. Uh, anything else uh, outside of wine and vines that you're looking ahead to? I think, uh, I think if I, if I want to keep my, my bride happy, and we're, we're coming up on our 50th anniversary this December. Congratulations Thank ahead you. of time. <laughs> uh, She's looking to get, you know, spend some time away from the vineyard and, and do more vacationing and, uh, you know, house on a lake is her goal. The vineyard on the hill is my goal, so we've got to find a way to combine those. And uh, I think we've got time and we've got, uh, you know, we're at that stage in the life where we can start to do some things away from the vineyard, particularly from November through uh, March. You know, there's plenty of time to go do that, but that's not the most pleasant time to be on a lake in Oregon. Uh, but during the summertime, you know, we can find ways to make that happen too. As I hand off, you know, all the farming's done by Javier. If I can hand off some of the tractor work and then get the wine tasting where it's more event driven at those beginning and the end of the season, then we'd have plenty of time to do that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where we're headed. And even now I can take, you know, I can take three, four, five days away and just let the tour companies know I'm not going to be here for this week. You can bring tour people over, but Ruby's going to be the only one here. And she doesn't pour very well. She'd be great company, but she doesn't have the pouring technique down very well. <laughs> that would be a good trick. Yeah. <laughs> so as you, as you look back, uh, what's been the most rewarding part of this experience for you? I think uh, there's a number of things that I've just really enjoyed about it and feel rewarded about it. The, uh, you know, bringing it from a hazelnut orchard to where it is today and being able to look over your shoulder and kind of close your eyes and see that hazelnut orchard and then open your eyes and see where it is today. Um, that's kind of a fun movie to play in your head. Uh, you know, it's like those last minutes of your life where you play the movie, but you play that last 15-year movie in your head 
and you close your eyes, and it's kind of a neat progression to watch the vineyard build out and to see what it, what it's what's uh, the hazelnut orchard has turned into. Mm -hmm. That's rewarding and satisfying. The quality of the uh, the product that we've wound up is is very uh, rewarding and. You know, you're always really nervous when you go into something like this. Is is it going to work? Is it going to be good? Are people going to like it? And to get to the point where I am today, where I'm getting uh, you know positive feedback from the customers, uh, not only in their purchasing patterns, but in their uh, appreciation for the wine and the wine club, um, that's all very rewarding as well. I think uh, you know the, to just be able to have this in my backyard every day to wake up here and look out the window and have that have this lifestyle. Uh, you, everybody kind of takes their lifestyle for granted because you're in it all the time. Uh, and every now and then I just find myself in the middle of 30 acres and I look up and I go, is this my 30 acres? Is, is this my, yeah, and it's, am I responsible for, and the other side of it is, am I responsible for keeping this all going? And yes, you are. <laughs> don't, don't slack off, but uh, it's it's uh, it's rewarding. It's uh, it's got a lot of feedback, and it's got that it's got that holistic kind of Zen thing about it as well. That energy level that uh, you're kind of a part of and plugged into that uh, you just don't get when you're living in a condo in the city. Mm -hmm. you know, it's a different energy level living in a condo in the city than in a vineyard in the in wine country, particularly Ribbon Ridge wine country. Mm -hmm. So. Lots of good things there, and it's 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 a lifestyle. It's it's not just a, a job or a, a project. It's a life, mm -hmm. and uh, I think more than anything, I'm appreciative and, and really have uh, grown to appreciate that. That it's a, it's a whole from morning to sun, beginning of the day to the it's all it's it's your life, mm -hmm. and it's not a bad way to go. <laughs> That's all the questions that I have for Great. you. Anything I didn't ask that I should have? Anything that we didn't cover that you'd like to cover? I think you covered. I'm just hoping that I get close some of those loops. The questions are so open ended that it's <laughs> it's hard to make sure you got no. back to the question you answered. But I think we hit most of it. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. Did, you did a great job of closing those loops. No okay. worries at all. Good. Thank you so much for yeah, your my time, pleasure. hospitality. Thanks for coming out. Yeah. Thank you to Ruby as well for some background in yeah. background in noise <laughs> and background in a, a, a little chorus. Thank you so much. We'll let you off the hook. Rich, thank you. Thank my you. pleasure.